we're going to continue on in this journey of the book of Hebrews, what a book it is. And uh, I, I, maybe some of this tonight will seem a little redundant uh, because the writer, who I believe to be Paul, but the writer hangs on this priesthood thought for a while. And the reason he does, see, we wouldn't maybe understand that, but the reason he does is a Jewish mind has trouble taking in everything that he's saying, so he's having to say it almost kind of repetitively. We learn through repetition. But I will say this is the last chapter where he dwells on the priesthood of Christ, which is better than the Old Testament priesthood. That's the thing about the book of Hebrews. In every chapter, Jesus Christ is better than something in the Old Testament. And from here, I mean, we've got a better priesthood. Next week, we're going to find out there's a better sacrifice that's been made. There's better blood, praise God. It was offered in a better place, hallelujah. And that's why our salvation is so great. We really should appreciate it. We really should appreciate it. It's, uh, I, I really don't know that we can fully comprehend it all. But I say this, it, when the Bible is not just filling up space when it talks about so great salvation. Yes. This is great salvation. Amen. All right, as a review of last week, chapter 6 is about moving on to maturity and uh, getting away, moving past the first principles of Christ. The writer states in chapter 6 that it is impossible for saved individuals to become lost again, but if they could, it is un- impossible for them to be resaved. So th- that doctrine is heresy. There's a lot of good people that believe that. I'm not angry at them, but the doctrine is bad. It's not biblical. Uh, And and I say this, somebody said, well, are those those people saved? Absolutely. The problem's not here, it's here. That's not the issue. Uh, But that's what the the writer says. It's impossible for somebody to be lost and re-saved because what he's saying is that the the work of the cross wasn't enough. Amen. Amen. So this is a foundational truth that he wants the readers, you and I, not to be hung up on this point. Here's why he wants us to be sure about our salvation, so that we can go on. If we, can't ever, if we have to keep rehashing that, we can't never go on. That's why he's saying, go on, move past this. That is secure, go forward. So, uh, the point of it is about moving on forward to maturity and productivity, to become productive. In Jesus Christ. So having said that, we're going to jump in. You're going to hear some of the same things that was said maybe two weeks ago because Melchizedek was brought up, I believe, in chapter 5. He's, there's more time spent on him in chapter 7. So if I say the same things I did a couple weeks ago, I won't dwell there. I'll just mention it and move on. Hebrews 7, verses 1 through 4 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being, by interpretation, king of righteousness. That's what his name means, by interpretation. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, uh, end of life but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. The writer here is teaching that Melchizedek, who literally is only in a couple of verses in Genesis, he's mentioned again in Psalms 110, I believe, just for a verse. Outside of that, we probably wouldn't give him much thought. But the writer here wants you to understand that he's an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ. You, people that's been here for a long time, you've heard me say it. I know people that's been here a long time heard my dad say this. We'll say this is a type. When we say this is a type, it means it's a symbol. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture representation so that we can see it. We're visual people. Jesus Christ taught people visually. That's why he said a sower went forth to sow seed. He understood we'd understand about that. And he taught us biblical truth about fishing, about sowing, about farming, uh, about those things. So when we say it's a type, what he's saying is if we look at Melchizedek, we'll see something about Jesus Christ. I like what Brother Harold Seitler said. And he's in heaven now. He said, when you read your Bible, look for Jesus. He's on every page. And he is on every page. Sometimes you have to look a little harder than others, but he's somewhere in every story, everything. This whole book is about him. So Melchizedek is an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ as both a king and a priest. That blows a Jewish mind because all they know is those things are separated. We get our kings from Judah. We get our priests from Levi, those tribes. 
So it's, it boggles their imagination a little bit to see a man who's both a king and a priest. And the reason he's a type of Jesus Christ is because Jesus Christ is both a king and a priest forever. Amen. Now, when the scripture says here, a lot of people get tripped up on this. That Melchizedek says, when it says he's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, that don't mean he's eternal, the man. It means in the scriptures. In the scriptures, we have no record of his mother and father. We have no record of his death. We have no record of his genealogy. If he has children, we don't know anything about them. The reason for that is he, he's preserved as a type. Jesus Christ has no beginning. He has no ending. Amen. He had no descent. He didn't have any children after him. He's eternal. He's as far back as you want to go, and he's as far out in the future as you want to go. So that's what Melchizedek is a picture of. It doesn't mean that the man, this man was eternal. I will say this because there will be people watching me who have probably heard what I'm getting ready to say. There's a lot of supposing about who this Melchizedek is, a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, believe that he's Shem. He's the son of Noah. That can't be so. Here's why that can't be so. It's an interesting thought because we know who Shem's mother and father are. Right. We know his descent. We know his beginning. We know his ending. Right. So they can't be him. This man literally is an enigma. He just appears out of nowhere. Uh, his name means king of righteousness. That's another type of Jesus Christ. He's the king of Salem. That's the original name for Jerusalem. When Jesus Christ comes back, his kingdom, the capital, is Jerusalem. Amen. The Bible said it's the city of the great king. So someday, walls, the, the gates will open, the king will walk in, and he will be at home. Amen. Going to sit on the throne of David. Oh, that does a little something for me. Amen. I enjoy that. Amen. Yeah. Now, so that's what that means. What it's drawn is, it's drawn a picture. We're saying when we look back at this man in Scripture, he's a type of Jesus Christ. Verses 5 through 9. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, you've got to remember, the Old Testament priesthood came out of Levi. That's what he's saying. Who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them, uh, from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth, receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. Here's the reason that the writer wants to dwell on this point about Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. You pay tithes to somebody who's greater than you. Amen. Now, Abraham, in a Jewish mind, it don't get any greater. Mm -hmm. I mean, Abraham and Moses are like in the top rung of their mind, of their admiration. The whole nation came from him. I understand all that. He's the one that got all the, all the promises. The scripture here says, wants to show you that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham because Abraham paid tithes to him. Right. Now, not only that, the Levitical priesthood received tithes because they didn't farm, they didn't work their own land. Their job was to wait on the Lord and do his service continually. So the nation paid tithes that helped them have, have cities, have houses, have property and everything else. So what he's saying here is he said even Melchizedek is greater than Levi because Levi paid tithes to him when he was inside of his father Abraham. That's not milk, honey. That's meat. Amen. That's, that, you have to stop and think about that yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so he's saying he's greater. The point of this is, is that Christ's priesthood is like Melchizedek, and Jesus Christ's priesthood is greater than Aaron's. Amen. God ordained Aaron to be the first high priest, all of his children. And if you were, were a priest in the Old Testament, you had to be born of the tribe of Levi and everything else. He's saying Jesus Christ, his priesthood is superior to all of that. Amen. He'll build on that idea here in just a moment. Verses 10 through 14. He said, for he was yet in his loins, talking about Levi. He was yet in the loins of his father. Levi was inside of Abraham when he, ble when he paid tithes to Melchizedek, when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. 
For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. The reason, like I said before, the reason the writer is hammering away at this, a Jewish mind is struggling with a priest that didn't come from Levi. Right. Doesn't understand it. Now, I want to say this here, that he said, uh, he said uh, that the Levitical priesthood could not bring forth perfection. Here's why we had to have another covenant, because the first covenant made nothing perfect. Right. And I'm going to say this, and I hope I don't lose you. I've said it before. God can't accept anything less than perfection. Right. Amen. You can't go to heaven and not be perfect. Right. Right. Now, that's troubling till you understand you ain't going like you. Amen. You got in somebody that was perfect, and now you can go into the presence of God. Amen. 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 I will say this, the only righteousness God accepts is the kind he gives. It's the only kind. So, the Old Testament priesthood was not perfect. It didn't make anybody perfect. So God had to disannul it. We'll read that in the next few verses. He had to change it. That's what the writer here says. Why did he have to change it? I'm going to say this to you, and I may, maybe you've never considered this. Do you realize God had to completely do away with the law? I don't mean break it. Jesus Christ fulfilled it. But after he fulfilled it, God had to do away with it. If God didn't do away with it, we'd still have Aaron's sons being priests. Right. Right. So the fact that we don't have Aaron's sons being priests tells me God did away with it. Amen. Now, I'll tell you something. I never was, I'm not a Jew. I was never under the first covenant. I never had to go through any of that rigmarole or anything else like that. But I'll tell you something. As a Gentile who's saved, I praise God that the law has been done away with. Amen. I don't want 613 precepts I can't keep. Amen. I'm glad righteousness has been given to me by faith. Now, the priesthood was changed, changed from one tribe to another. That's what he said. He said, it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He didn't come out of Levi. Okay. He said, Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So the priesthood had nothing to do with Judah. But Jesus Christ came out of Judah. That's another point of why Jesus Christ is like Melchizedek not Aaron. Right. Verses 15 through 18. And it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness... Uh, Disannulling of the commandment, going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. You got to understand this. In the Old Testament, a man could just become a priest just because he was born in the right family. Didn't have anything to do with his character, his moral standing. I could go through the Bible and show you there were a lot of priests that were wicked. God slayed Eli's sons because they were sleeping with women at the temple and they were stealing God's sacrifice. Don't sound to me like these good men. Somebody said, How come they were priests? They were born into it. They were sons of Levi. They're not the only ones. Aaron's first two sons got slayed in the holy place. Not good people. So here's the thing about it. That priesthood was weak. It didn't satisfy God. It didn't satisfy men. So God disannulled it. The word disannulled. The word disannulled means that he made it void. He made it void so he could put another priesthood in its place that is perfect. Now think about this. Why would you want to, and I'm not talking about you per se, I'm talking about these Jews. He's saying, why would you want to cling to a priesthood that wasn't no good to start with? Right. It wasn't perfect to start with. He said, why wouldn't you want to take hold of a priest that is perfect? Amen. Doing a perfect job forever. Amen. I read the scriptures, right, where he said he's a priest forever. Yeah. You know what that means in the Greek? Forever. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Now, Christ didn't receive the priesthood by birth. He received it by an oath. God swore. God ordained him. Now, somebody said, how did this Melchizedek become a priest? God made him one. That's all we know. 
That's what he's saying. Jesus Christ is like him because he wasn't born into it. God made him one. Now, you can disagree with me because this is just my opinion, and your opinion is as good as mine. When it says today, when he says, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, I believe that was said on the resurrection day. How do I, why would I say that? Because the Father raised him up. The Father raised him up because he was pleased with what he did three days ago. Amen. Yeah. You are my son. Today have I begotten thee, begotten you from the dead, begotten you from the tomb. Well, Jesus Christ wasn't made a high priest until after the resurrection. He wasn't walking around down here on earth as a high priest. Jesus Christ was a prophet. There are three offices in the Old Testament that were anointed. A prophet, a high priest, and a king. Jesus Christ is a prophet, high priest, and a king. Right. Now, having said that, so God disannulled Aaron's priesthood, did away with it, established a new one forever. Now, all of this sounds boring to your ears until we get down to the last two verses. When we get down to the last two verses, if it really sinks in, we might have to tie you down. Uh, we're going somewhere. Verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. Stop right there. I had somebody in Sunday school years ago when I was teaching young adults back here say, and I, they didn't think it through. They, I said, nobody in the Old Testament died and went to heaven. Not one. And when you stop and think about that, you're like, oh, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that Abraham and... and Abel and Moses and David, they didn't go to heaven. You heard me right. They didn't go. They stayed right here. They went into the heart of the earth. Here's why they couldn't go into heaven. A way hadn't been made. And then that, that young person said, but I thought the animal sacrifices. I said, if the animal sacrifices get us, get us to heaven, we didn't need Jesus Christ. We just keep on sacrificing bulls and goats. You can't go into the presence of God without a way being made. Amen. God had a place for them to go. You read the Old Testament just like I can. It says they went unto their people. Yeah. They went unto their fathers. Even Joseph knew as a righteous man, he knew he was going to the pit. Mm -hmm. Talked about it. Yeah. David talked about the pit. Talked about going down. What, he, what he's saying is we know that we're going to stay right here. Right. Paradise was under. Mm -hmm. yeah. Under. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. But when Jesus Christ shed his blood, see, I love this. It wasn't just that Jesus Christ shed his blood and it covered out all the sins out in the future. It covered everything as far back as it goes forward. And Jesus Christ walked into paradise on the three days his body was laying in the tomb and said, the, people, the one you were looking for, I'm him. Amen. The one you prophesied about, I'm him. Amen. Abel, when you laid that lamb down on the offering way back in Genesis chapter 4, that was me. Right. Right. Noah, when you got in the boat, that was me. Amen. Amen. All you folks that came out of Egypt by the shed blood of the perfect lamb, that lamb is a picture of me. Now let's go on to higher ground. Amen. Amen. That's what it means when it says he led captivity captive. He took them out and took them into the presence of God. Right. Animal sacrifices couldn't get you up there. So I'm glad for this blood. It's a precious blood. Amen. The law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. There's, I said this, I think, at the beginning of Hebrews. There's two words in Hebrews you need to see. It says it over and over. Once and better. Amen. Jesus Christ only had to die once, Amen. and this covenant is better. <laughs> once and better. Bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. The Jewish mind... Looking in the Old Testament, that old covenant, you couldn't draw nigh to God. God didn't want you close to him. His holiness would kill you. Right. Right. That's right. You look everywhere you want to in the Old Testament. Wherever God is, people got to go somewhere else. Right. He moved into the tabernacle. The priests had to go outside. Right. God came down on the mountain. He told Moses, don't you let anybody touch the mountain. If they do, kill them. Amen. Somebody said, what is that? God being mean? No, it's holiness. Right. God's holiness and our sinfulness kept us dead. Somebody said, what's changed? Jesus Christ removed our sin. Amen. So since Jesus Christ, what was in our way, Jesus Christ took it out of the way. Now we can get as close to God as we want to get. Amen. That does a little something for me. Amen. That's what he's saying. Now we can draw nigh to God. Aren't you glad when the Holy Ghost manifests himself in his place, you ain't got to go to the parking lot? Amen. 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 
I've told some folks before, I said, I, I've had some prayer meetings in my car on the way to Fort Wayne, and it got foggy in there. I don't know how I got to Fort Wayne. I just know the Lord got me there somehow. Right. So he said, what do you mean it got foggy? The glory. Yes. Yeah. I don't mean I saw a fog. I'm saying his presence got so thick in there, it was almost like I could reach out and get a hold of him. Yeah. Jesus Christ wants you to know he's real. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Verses 20 through 22. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest. For those priests were made without an oath. In other words, Aaron's sons were, born, like I said, they were born into it. God didn't ordain them to it. But, but Jesus Christ was. But this with an oath. By him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I said before a few weeks ago, I say again, when the Bible says the Lord swear and will not repent, that means he'll never change his mind about it. Now, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. The word surety means security against loss or damage. Right. Security for payment. If you go in to, to borrow some money and maybe your credit ain't all it should be and the bank is concerned about whether they're going to get their money back from you or not, they'll say, we need a cosigner. Mm -hmm. The cosigner has to have better credit than you right. Right. because the bank has to know if you fail to pay, Somebody has to be the surety. Right. Right. Yep. Now, I want you to know the scripture here don't say you doing the best you can is the surety of a better testament. It said Jesus is the surety right. of a better testament. Right. You know what it means? The balance fell to him and he paid it all. Amen. Amen. It's a better testament. The, 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 the writer here, as you notice as we go through, he's not at any time putting the, the, the response or the onus on you to keep this. Right. He keeps pointing you to Jesus Christ. Right. Here's why. When you get a hold of that, you'll quit worrying about you and you'll start glorifying him. Right. Yes. I like what D.L. Moody said. He said, I'm so glad we're not saved by works. He said, because I couldn't stand to get to heaven and listen to everybody brag about how they got there. Yes, <laughs> this is the truth. When we get there, we're going to praise him. Amen. We're there because of him. Yes. He's the surety. Right. This covenant is better because he's the payment. Now, the last two verses, we said all of that to say this. This is the blessing. It's all good. This is the blessing. And they truly were many priests, talking about the Levitical priesthood, because they kept dying. Because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. A priest would die, have another one have to come into his place. A priest would die, another one would come into his place. But this man, because he continueth ever. Amen. hath an unchangeable priesthood. As good as that is, hold on, it's getting ready to get better. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Look at my face. Somebody said, what does uttermost mean? It means you can't get any more saved. I don't care how good you do, you can't get any more saved than you already are. Now you can get more sanctified, but you can't get any more saved because he saved you to the uttermost. Amen. Now, uttermost means in the most extensive degree fully. Why is he able to save us to the uttermost? Because he ever liveth. Your security hangs on his priesthood. Amen. My cousin who pastors a church down in Whitley, Kentucky, told me this many years when I first started preaching and didn't know anything. Now I just know a little. But I didn't know anything 20 years ago. He told me in his living room, I've never forgot it. He said, if you don't understand the priesthood of Christ, he said, you can't understand security. Right. Because it ain't one verse here or one verse right. there. I mean, there are verses. He said, you have to understand what Jesus Christ is doing now. Right. I like that, that he's able to save them to the uttermost. Amen. That means he does an excellent job saving people yes. that come unto God by him. Here's why. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, that don't mean anything to you if you don't know what intercession is. Intercession means the act of mediating between parties that are at variance with a view of reconciliation. Right. Somebody said, my preacher, 
I did things today that was wrong. Am I unsaved? No. Why? Because your high priest is mediating. Amen. Amen. That don't mean, I, I, would say, I would say that there's times that God gets with us kind of like he did Israel. I think there's times he probably would like to burn us up like ants. Right. But he can't do it because there's, there's a priest sitting next to him with holes in his hands and holes in his feet and blood on the mercy seat. And he says, I'm the payment. I'm the surety. You can't kick him out because of these holes. You can't kick him out because of that blood. They're in me. That's going to do something for me if it ain't doing nothing for you at all. You stay saved not because you tithe, not because you come to church all the time, not because of the clothes you wear or the Bible you carry. You stay saved because you have a faithful high priest that ever lives and keeps you saved. Amen. What do you think the Bible means when it says we're kept? Kept. We're kept saved by him he mediates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He never fails. He won't start today. He's never failed me. He won't start today. And I like this, and I want to pass this on to the younger Christians, because see, when we make mistakes and mess up, the devil is going to try to lie to you and be like, see, God don't want nothing to do with you anymore. And, and there's no need to pray and everything else. And then you're going to, if you listen to that, you, you won't pray. No, no, no. What I've learned is when I fail, I don't need to run away from God. I need to run to God and confess it as fast as I can. Amen. And the high priest is going to make sure that that all gets wiped out, wiped away. I tell you what, when God forgives you, it's like you've never done it to start with. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So when I, I when I was a younger Christian, I, I'd get in shapes or my state would get bad, and I think, man, I I just don't know about praying or anything like that. I mean, I just don't know about it. No, 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 no. Listen, the faster you can get to the throne of grace, the better off you're going to be. Amen. 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 Brother Joe Arthur says it like this. He said, Jesus saves them from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen. I like that myself. This all looks to me like, if I understand this right, that this salvation that we have is precious and it's secure because of him. Amen. It's about because of him. That's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to help these Jewish Christians understand. They're struggling. They're struggling. They're not used to a testament like this. They're not used to a priesthood like this. And so they struggle with that. But I like that Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost Amen. because he ever lives. Amen. Amen. All right, that's all I've got for you this evening. I hope it was a blessing. Stand to your feet. We'll be dismissed. Dad, say a word of prayer for us, please.